Microchips are the brains of almost every modern device that we use. From cars and mobile phones to MRI scanners and industrial machines. We make over 900 billion of these tiny devices every single year. Technological advances mean that they've been shrinking in size and increasing in power at a huge rate. It is microchips that mean we can walk around with smartwatches more powerful than computers that took up whole rooms just a few decades ago. Today, they're integral to almost everything we do. They keep our planes in the skies and our cars on the roads. But what would happen if we suddenly couldn't get hold of any new chips? Well, this is a question that has been worrying experts and legislators around the world for a while. This is Beyond the Headlines. I'm James Haynes Young. And this week, we're looking at how countries are racing to make sure they have a stable supply of microchips. Before we start, if you like this podcast, why not hit subscribe in your podcasting app to get all the latest episodes as soon as they're released. Asking what would happen if we suddenly couldn't get hold of microchips isn't a hypothetical thought experiment. It is already an issue. Only a small number of firms make almost all of the most powerful chips in the world. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit and factories closed, and workers were forced to stay at home by lockdowns, global supplies of microchips nosedived. This had a huge knock-on impact that's still being felt months and years after production lines restarted. The pandemic meant that car companies couldn't get new chips to run top-of-the-range features, and you'll see that even in 2022, many models have scaled back functions as they rely on older chips. Order times for new laptops have suddenly gone up. Apple cut iPhone production numbers. Sony has struggled to ship enough new PlayStation 5s to meet the seemingly endless demand. Nearly two years after the first launch, the console sells out in many shops almost as soon as new stocks arrive. All of this is in part or largely because of the challenges in sourcing new microchips. One of the issues is that Taiwan makes nearly 60% of the world's microchips and about 90% of the world's most powerful microchips. These are called leading edge chips. The Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, TSMC for short, dominates the market. That makes the world's supply of microchips very fragile. Pandemics, natural disasters or conflicts could easily hit global stocks or shut countries out of the global supply chain entirely. Before we go any further though, let's talk about what exactly a microchip is and how it works. That will help us understand why the answer to the issue of a fragile, concentrated supply chain of microchips isn't just simply about making more of them elsewhere. So microchips are small slivers of silicon covered in electronic circuits that act as tiny switches that turn a current on and off. That allows computers to carry out calculations, depending on if the switch is on or off. And that is a fundamental element of all computer programming. Now, a modern microchip the size of a fingernail can be packed full of billions of these tiny circuits. Apple's M1 Max chip for their new MacBook Pro laptops is one of the most powerful consumer chips ever built. It's packed with 57 billion of these circuits called transistors and it can be held in the palm of your hand. The machines to make these new microchips are themselves hugely complicated. Incidentally, the Dutch company ASML holds a virtual monopoly on the machines to make the best chips in the world. These machines use ultraviolet light to shave off layers and etch the silicon chips to fit the transistors. The smaller the pattern for the circuits, the more powerful the chip. The best machines can etch between 5 and 10 nanometers wide for each transistor. That's 5 to 10 billionths of a meter. By comparison, a human hair is 100 nanometers wide, and a blood cell is about 10 nanometers wide. We'll talk a bit more later about the challenges in producing chips, but it's important to understand the scale and the challenges that go into manufacturing them. So what's the solution to securing a steady supply of microchips? 
while the US, the EU and China are betting that massive government investment can help them build a domestic industry to rival Taiwan. In August 2022, President Joe Biden signed the CHIPS Act to provide $52 billion for American semiconductor research, development and manufacture. The EU and China are spending almost as much to do the same. The advantage that the EU and the US have in their proposal is working with Korean, Japanese and Taiwanese firms to help build this domestic production. Domestic production means building what's called chip foundries, or fabs for short. These are hugely expensive though, between 10 and 15 billion dollars, and they require highly trained workers. China, however, has been locked out of some of the most advanced hardware by the US. Washington has used its financial and diplomatic clout to persuade Taipei not to sell the best chips to Beijing. So can the US, Europe and China just spend money to build a microchip industry? Well, Jonathan, an industry veteran from Silicon Valley who's now based in Taiwan and goes just by his first name, says that it's not going to be straightforward. The key assumption here is that onshoring is something that's going to work. The assumption is that, and I've seen this, people say this sentiment in the internet where they just caught random comments where say, you know, now that America has brought these fabs back to America, we don't need to worry about Taiwan or something like that. Jonathan warns that even if the US plan succeeds and a significant number of production plants are built in the US, Taiwan will still be a dangerous choke point in the global supply chain. And much would be at risk in a conflict with China. Because that's essentially 60% of the world's semiconductors going offline, plus that's including 95% of their high end. So there is no onshoring that fixes this. Indeed, building an industry that can rival Taiwan's chip makers will take years and a lot of investment, especially when Korea's Samsung and Taiwan's TSMC are in the middle of a hundred billion investment plan they hope will secure their leading place in the industry. But the US does have one advantage over some of its rivals. It might not make the chips, but US firms design at least half of all the chips made. This in itself is a hugely complex task, and it's half the battle. China faces the same hurdles, and its tech is lagging behind. Only 17% of China's chip demands are produced domestically, and only half of that production is done by Chinese firms. While Apple's M1 chip is a 5 nanometer transistor, China has recently managed to make its own 7 nanometer prototype. But it's done so using older machines that make it unlikely that Beijing will be able to mass produce these anytime soon. Chinese hardware and semiconductor manufacturing isn't quite there yet either especially when it comes to AI chips and GPUs, which tend to require larger chips. And uh, very few companies are capable of making those. Well, essentially, there's only one company capable of making those. That company is Taiwan's TSMC. Now, TSMC might be the industry leader making the most advanced chips in the world, but it's not exactly operating alone. Indeed, it buys its microchip manufacturing machines from the Dutch company ASML, which in turn is made with what the manufacturers call the most precise mirrors in the world, developed by Germany's Carl Zeiss and other parts from all over the world. The chip designs are produced by Apple, Nvidia, Qualcomm and other huge tech names. Other firms have specialised in the process of connecting these advanced chips to other electrical components in microscopic wiring. Japanese and US firms work on the chemical processes for nanoscale insulation and protection of the chip circuitry. Taiwan and Korea dominate the assembly of the chips, a process of over a thousand steps done by highly skilled workers toiling sometimes for 12 hours a day trying to ensure there are no defects. They work in precisely temperature controlled rooms that are almost dust free. The most impressive machine they're using made by ASML, blasts a stream of 50,000 tiny droplets of tin per second through a pair of lasers, causing explosions registering 200,000 degrees Celsius to create ultraviolet light 
that etches the silicon for the tiny transistors. So while Taiwan dominates the assembly of the chips, it's only possible because of the work of firms all over the world. Chip production is truly a globalised industry. It would be very, very difficult for any one company or even one country to excel at every stage of the manufacturing process to the extent that they can replace this globalised industry. But these firms choose to outsource assembly to Taiwan to avoid the huge costs trying to build world-class fabs. Charles Wessner is an expert on emerging technology at Georgetown University. He studied the creation of technological clusters like those needed to make microchips. It, it requires us to do things differently and getting companies that are competitors to cooperate, particularly when they're from different nationalities, can be done. And they do it uh, both in IMEC, the outstanding European center, you know, the IMAC. He says this kind of cooperation can help build a workforce skilled enough for the extremely specialised operations of making microchips. He points out that the US is home to one of two of the best research institutions for microchip technology in the world, the Sunny Poly College of Nanoscale Science and Engineering in Albany. But the US, he says, still needs to leverage its alliances. There's certainly a movement uh, with uh, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, uh, the US and Europe to collaborate more. We've asked and the Japanese and, um, and the Koreans and Taiwan are both, Samsung and TSMC are both building major facilities in the US, but not at their most cutting edge level of production. And that may be in part because of the uh, of some of the the talent challenges, you know, they, they work really hard and in a really regimented fashion in, in Taiwan and Korea. And I'm not describing the whole culture of Taiwan. I'm talking about TSMC's culture, you know, which is really quite, quite driven. I think there's something like 7% of the GDP of Taiwan. Jonathan agrees and says that this alliance of tech leaders could give the US a head start with its $50 billion of investment. Taiwan and South Korea and the United States and Netherlands, of course, and Europe are founders and intimate players in how some, the semiconductor industry as a whole works, right? In addition to the tacit knowledge is the ability of TSMC or Intel or Samsung to work extremely closely with the best supplier in that particular field. They won't take calls from anyone except the people they've already intimately worked with because they already know. And those people are the experts of that particular field. For instance, for instance like uh, like ASML relies on Carl Zeiss, right? So you have these situations, these relationships are very intimate, very close, and necessarily not exactly easy to break in. But the question still remains, can the US build enough fabs to take Taiwan on? Here's Charles again. Well, I think they'll move forward fairly rapidly. They're planning to with these new fabs. And uh, the question is whether they can effectively catch TSMC, because it really is TSMC that's it's got the lead, along with Samsung. Charles says that the subsidies in the CHIPS Act will help significantly, but there are a lot of nerves before the fabs get up and running. The second looming challenge is having enough skilled workers to run them. You've got billions of dollars sitting there not producing anything. You don't have to be an advanced economist to think that that's not good. You can't afford the suits and the delays. And we have serious challenges in producing enough talent to run these facilities. Intel and TSMC are competing ferociously for engineers and technicians in Arizona and, and the same with Samsung in Texas. In the long run, Jonathan says he thinks the US will accelerate domestic production of leading edge chips. And Charles is nonetheless optimistic about the new alliance forming around chip production. But just to close an optimistic note, the collaboration and the trust in a place like Europe means that I was asking a German research, uh, a representative of German research minister, what would they think if we had managed to, uh, you know, find a company that would uh, refurbish a, a fab in Ireland, would build a test and assembly facility in Italy and build a research facility in France and build a huge fab in Germany. Well, that's what Intel is doing. So 
it's just a whole breath of fresh air in, into the uh, semiconductor ecosystem. But where does this global chips alliance leave China? Well, largely out in the cold. While they've had some success in domestic production, largely using the TSMC and ASML processes and technologies, they still lag behind. And Jonathan points out that the intricacy involved in the production of microchips, as highlighted by this globalised industry of players, means that no country will be able to just leapfrog through investment, force or subterfuge. If you steal a concept, if you steal a piece of IP, that's getting harder to do, first of all. But also, secondly, you know, it's a piece of the puzzle. But in terms of a semiconductor manufacturing process and all the trade secrets behind that, it's just as important that you're able to have the whole process, if you understand, and have access to the best equipments. The experts insist that the same logic applies to those concerned that China may seek to unify the mainland with Taiwan by force and by extension acquire Taiwan's dominant microchip firms. They point out that doing so would likely lead to international sanctions that would cut them off from this global supply chain of machines, know-how and parts. But largely alone, China has produced a prototype 7 nanometer chip, even as TSMC, Apple and Intel look towards 5 nanometer and even smaller processors. Microchips power almost every device we use, even the ones we used to make this podcast and the machines you're using to listen to it. But they're extraordinarily complicated and costly to make, a fact that has left the world reliant on a few highly specialised producers to make almost all of them. This carries a great risk. If countries were concerned before, the recent experience of Russia has focused minds. In response to the invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, the West imposed crippling sanctions. Washington pressured suppliers to block sales of chips to Moscow. Almost overnight, the Russian military machine was set back decades. They couldn't replenish supplies of guided missiles without microchips. New tanks and armoured personnel carriers couldn't be made. Night vision goggles and other advanced infantry equipment was now impossible. The government started to raid consumer equipment to try and solve the shortage. But it's not just the Russian military that's been hit. The domestic electronics industry and the car industry have effectively been set back decades. And it's not like Russia looks set to announce a successful domestic chip industry almost overnight to restore this lost supply. This leaves them in a difficult position. Other countries, including China and the US, will be watching the fallout very closely. Thanks this week to Jonathan in Taiwan and Charles Wessner in the US. This was Beyond the Headlines. I'm James Haynes-Young. And this week, we were produced by Robert Tollist and Arthur Edison and Tom Smith. If you like this episode and want to get each one as soon as it comes out, hit subscribe in your podcast app. And while you're there, why not leave us a review? It really helps. <laughs>